It's gonna be it's gonna be interesting morning. We're gonna like the tables are gonna be turned. I'm gonna interview you because essentially I'm coming off the back of um, a night of cocoa pops based fever dreams. <laughs> so it's gonna be an interesting morning. <laughs> wow. Can we dig into that first? Yes. So my little girl Luna um, does not sleep in her bedroom anymore. As much as my design thinking hack worked for a while, it has stopped working. Um, so now, essentially, I sleep on what is um, a farm. So this me, my other half, two dogs and a toddler <laughs> in the space of like two meters. We've got a pretty decent sized house, but no, everyone likes to be that close. Um, so to try and get her, the only thing that it was a, a possible kind of like carrot in getting her back to her bed is the concept of cocoa pops in the morning like the <laughs> zenith breakfast snack that is cocoa pops um that win yeah time. so last night she was fighting it like she didn't want to go back to her bedroom but also she really didn't want to give up the cocoa pops and it's like it's 3 a.m it's 30 degrees <laughs> just pick a lane <laughs> so yeah after that I went back to sleep and just had dreams of Coco the monkey, which in normal terms I'd be pretty chuffed with. Not last night. Not, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There's a time and a place for Coco the monkey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, that, it's, it's vile, isn't it? When it's so hot and then you've just suddenly got people. And I, like... I, I say this as someone who... It's, wait, no, just by the way, like, we cut that, like, it's really vile when there's people... <laughs> Violent people. Rewind that statement a little bit. Oh, God, it creates some, uh, but I'm someone that like I'm exothermic. I think that's the right word. Which okay. like I give out a lot of heat. Yeah, Simon like, does that. I know it's that. like sleeping in a fucking sauna. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just. I've been fine. The last two nights he's been in London, not a problem. Literally he came back last night. I was just like, what has gone on? The temperatures raised like. 10 degrees in our bedroom and not in it's a sexy way in the like just right. heat <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh, but it's 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 yeah it's it's awful it's absolutely mm -hmm. like anyway it's hot and we're british and we can't complain about warmth we can't complain so, about but we decided to dress up instead like because it's hot we decided to become overly <laughs> formal this morning <laughs> It just feels very British, doesn't it? We could be going to, I don't know, some kind of club in, in India. I like it. You know, you're in linen, really, I've got yeah. a rock on. Yeah. I've <laughs> still got a failure. Go. But instead, here we are uh, yes. <laughs> on, on Zoom or yes. similar. Hey. What, the the look, recording platform um, of our choice, yes. Yeah. Should we talk about that sometime? Talk about yeah, why definitely. we use Riverside. Riverside FM. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, the boss. Yeah. It's working it well for us. It is. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. That, that's that, really, um, really good. What was it now? It was Black Friday deal, wasn't it? That Black Friday deal is working out well for us. Boom. That's what you need. <laughs> Look for the discount. Get onto Riverside. Maybe we'll do a full, like, the stack, our content stack show. Yes. Where Jesus. we talk about that. We talk maybe about those AI tools that were sneaking, sneaking in there. How that's that. all working yes. out. Yeah, maybe we do that. But for today, we're going to talk about failure. Yep. We're going to talk about particularly my failure. I don't know why I've got a golf tee. Come on, you loser. Yeah. What's happened? <laughs> yeah, I think it's time. It's time people heard this, heard the full story. It's time, yep. you know, this has been something I've been carrying around for a long time. I've shared a few things about, about a, basically a big startup failure that I had a few years ago now. Um, mm -hmm. But I feel like I feel like the story, the proper full story needs to come out so that people people can learn some of those lessons. And actually, I can relearn some of those lessons as well, um, because I think they're the kinds of things that you don't just kind of learn once and know it forever. I think they're things that we kind of have to continue to repeat like mantras. Yes. Um, I will exercise today. I will exercise to that kind of thing. Um, these yes. are important, important life lessons. I want to just build shit. I will speak to people. I will test my assumptions. I will experiment. Yes, 100%. So tell exactly, us a little bit. Give exactly. us a bit of background then. What was the what was the idea? What was the story? How did you go about? Because you got funded, didn't you? Yeah, we did. So, so it's funny because I was the CEO of the company at the end, but I wasn't at the start. And okay. actually, the, the start of the company, it was called Future Builders. And the start of the company kind of had it had a, a number of stuttery starts if you like it was originally a concept that was 
um, kind of dreamt up and incubated within Founders Factory. So one of the big accelerators and incubators run uh, originally opened by um, um, Brent Hoberman. There's his name. Brent Hoberman. <laughs> I'm dreadful Last considering I live in this ecosystem like I and Dyer <laughs> with these things. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Brent Hoberman, who did lastminute.com with Martha Lane Fox and then made made.com. Um, nice. So two kind of rocket ship um, uh, unicorns in the startup world. And I think a bunch of other things as well. Been an investor and whatever else. He started Founders Factory. This Actually, this whole group of companies around Founders, Founders Forum, Founders Forum for Good, Founders Factory, um, Founders, everything else that you could imagine, I'm sure. Uh, and this this is this kind of accelerator and incubator. And what the, their model is that they incubate some ideas like in kind of internally um, okay. just to kind of validate, get some early validation. They yes. are funded by corporates. So there's often a partnership with a bigger corporate. This was a partnership around the learning space with, um, I think it was with Aviva, actually, uh, the Brilliant. insurance company. Um and then what happens is when if they get some kind of early stage validation on those original ideas, they go into an accelerator, which is where they kind of really try to, to grow those those companies. So there's kind of these little gates that happen. There's multiple ways in to the accelerator and whatever else, but that's the route that future builders took. So it was originally kind of founded by a diff, completely different team. And then what happens is when they kind of get to the next stage and want to accelerate it, they were looking for a for a new team, brand new CEO, someone to take it on fully. So I, at the time I was work, working at Makers Academy and had kind of spun out a brand new organization, a, an apprenticeship company, and it was just coming back into the organization. And I was kind of like, I've done my work here. I was there for about 18 months, whatever. I took that from zero revenue into about a million quid of revenue in the first 12 really? months. So, you know, really, really, yeah. really successful. And I think that's like their flagship thing now and makes us doing really well as, as a result yeah. of their apprenticeship but I was working originally with um, the marketing director who got the job basically as the CEO of Founders Fact of um, not Founders Factory of Future Builders this yeah. is a long story but I joined him I basically came on board as the uh, product officer chief product officer to basically build this very first product what it first started at as was a kind of a, like an online coding boot camp, a little bit like Makers Academy, a little bit like a whole bunch of others that are out there. But the idea was that was a corporate partnership that would sponsor each person and they'd do like a 12 week course or whatever to, to learn coding and software engineering. Awesome. We felt when we came in that that was a bit of a saturated market and actually, mm -hmm. and I hadn't really got the validation that we thought they had around yeah. that, uh, that idea. So we switched it to be more of a, originally a more of a, uh, and this is this is the original CEO's role to kind of switch it into a more of a like a um, a pre boot camp course. So okay. more of a like this will get you ready and accelerate you if you go nice. on a real journey towards being a software engineer. So really kind of the basics of coding fundamentals we will get you to that point and we'll be able to accelerate your journey. Um, we built a course. Uh, we did everything wrong. Right. So we, we <laughs> fell in love with that prop, that idea. We built a course yeah. and we put it out into a small group of like 20, 30 people, something like that. Friends and fr not friends, but like, yeah, close people that we knew yeah. that were interested in learning how to code. Yeah. Got about 20 people, 20 or 30. And um, a couple of weeks later, looking at, you know, who's doing what, how's it going? And there was only one person that had even opened the course to check out a single video out of those 20 right. people. All of these people had said they wanted to learn to code and hadn't okay. had that starting point but there's only one person that that kind of checked it checked it out and that person and was my build product the entire coach. course had you done We'd the entire built, course like, not the entire course but like a big substantial amount okay. of work right yeah and <laughs> yeah and um the only person that the, actually the only person that had checked it out was my product coach who was looking at it from a product perspective not because oh. of learning to code right so basically out of 20 30 people all of whom said they wanted to do a thing none of them actually did the thing. Okay, what are we gonna do? Yes. So this is the point where I started to go, okay, well, let's get serious about products now. Let's really try and figure out what it is we're trying to do. Let's pivot, let's try and switch things up and try and figure out what this company could be. And we went on a big journey of pivoting, I guess, completely pivoting. Um, and this is where really where my story really starts because that's like the early bit that pretty much the point where I took, I kind of got properly involved 
and um and, and and all of those failings aren't even the failings that i'm going to talk about now but oh, that's the story. okay right good interesting well i was going to say because there's a couple of things i want to dig into but i'm going to see what do you that. think your failings were and then yeah i can always loop back round. so what do you think your biggest takeaway is like what are the things you've learned definitely not to repeat again and kind of how do you go about things differently okay so they come basically down to people mm-hmm. what you've been involved the idea sorry <laughs> well you being involved that's the biggest thing <laughs> me being involved like if you want to start a startup don't <laughs> <laughs> oh and by the way this is me taking this because i would always choose spencer i would always have spencer on my team like every single day of the week so <laughs> thank you thank you it's appreciated it's appreciated if not for any other reason just from someone to laugh at right <laughs> yeah, i mean pants purely pants <laughs> so i so there's a couple of things so um people are really important um the people that you're working with the ethos that you have the values that you have the way that you want to operate together that's that was a major failing um it's validating ideas or invalidating ideas and that's a point i want to talk about quite a lot because we fell into the trap a couple of times of of basically confirmation bias and that for me is one of the biggest startup killers where what we were trying to do is validate our own hypotheses for for the feeling of being right rather than yeah. for the feeling of progress and making the doing the right thing working on the right problem and the right and the right solution so even if you're testing we did a lot of testing okay, but it was good. all looking for the metric that tells us that we're doing the right thing rather than right. looking for the things that tell us we're doing the wrong thing. So okay. it's a really interesting nuance, I think, about experimentation because people say, test your ideas and you're like, well, look, I've got three people that say they want to do this. It's going to be fine. Right. Yeah. But the reality is that the, you need to, you need to continue to test and build up, um, the, uh, yeah, like look for the, in, look for ways to invalidate your idea, have a belief that, have a belief that what you're doing is going to be great, but with the knowledge that you want to try to falsify it. And I think that's a completely different approach. I can um, agree more just to, to add to that. So when I work with founders, I'm almost, I had a bit of a reputation as a grim, a smiling grim reaper um, at the <laughs> incubator I used to work at. Because the thing is, I wanted, I'm like, my job is to keep you alive as long as possible. And I'm a pessimistic optimist or an optimistic pessimist i think optimistic pessimist but i so i want to yeah. really dig in like it comes from a place of love like i would challenge the shit out of you at times if it's needed if you aren't getting that like all the results you're showing me are just confirmation bias i'm like right okay we need to take this thing apart like i want to i want to really dig in and find out where the flaws are where the faults are why what's making it not sticky you know just because x amount of people have signed up have we retained them have we converted them like let's really dig in because otherwise it's just pollyanna-ish it's just like let's have a you know skip through the park and yeah it's not it's not going to go well for very long if you just have that kind of no, and it's kind right it's the kindness I, yeah. I i think about this a lot you know the kind thing to do is is to be at times brutally honest but perhaps in a nice way you've got to be yeah. super clear otherwise and, and i think that of course every single work walk of life right yeah. the 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 honest kind the kindness is to be as honest as you possibly can yes. um so and, been a critical uh, friend. You know, sometimes I take that a bit too far, by the way, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it depends on who you're working with. Like, I've had founders in the past right. where we are so aligned and we've worked together for, like, three or four years. I don't, there doesn't even need to be a shit sandwich. There's just, like, no, I'd, like, fundamentally disagree with that thing. And it's like, right, okay, we can just, like, unpick it and, you know, and it's wonderful. And I think there's, you know, a good friend, Ian, always says to me, I think it's... Um, strong words spoken kindly or softly or and that's an amazing mantra because people carry like hopes and dreams associated with these things but on the flip side 
if you're not really honest and straight up with them, then, you know, I, I've hear people all the time, like, I could sit in meetings and be like, yeah, that's amazing, definitely sell your house to fund that. Like, yeah, boss idea. They don't need to hear that. They need to hear the truth. So, yeah, but mm-hmm. obviously done in an emotionally intelligent way. And I think we've spoken about this in a, in a previous session, haven't we? Like, you know, that whole concept of don't be a dick. If you are in a position of responsibility helping startups, like... Just think about it. Have a yeah. bit of emotional intelligence. Watch Masterclass with Bill Clinton because apparently that's good. He's got a thing on emotional <laughs> intelligence as we were talking about. <laughs> Who'd have thought? Who'd have thought Who'd have that thought? on our little chat, Bill Clinton comes up with his, with his what is it, emotional intelligence or something? Emotional intelligence, yeah. Wow, okay. I mean, yeah. yeah, it'd be interesting to see the journey he went on from, you know, lying to an entire country and cheating on his wife publicly <laughs> to having emotional intelligence. Feels like something to watch. You've sold it to me. There's a story. <laughs> right there. There's a Amazing. I will watch it and report yes. back. <laughs> do, anyway, do, do, I digress. Do. So, so, yeah, yes. so point number one is don't fall into the trap of seeking confirmation on the biases that you already have when you're looking to test your ideas. It's incredibly easy to just seek, you know, those positive affirmations from people. It's really easy. And like, we know things like, you know, I I didn't go into this not knowing this world. I didn't go into this not having read the mum test or testing business ideas or all of the other, you know, product discovery, you know, all that great stuff. I didn't, I knew all of that, but it's still such an easy trap to fall into, especially when you've got someone that's funded you. And we were funded to the point of around about 250,000. So a quarter of a million quid, decent chunk of money, you know? Um, and so you've got this additional pressure of like wanting to get it right. And it almost felt like if I, as I look back now, I was kind of going through the, through the hoops of testing so that we could say that we're doing these things to the funder funders and whatever else you know mm-hmm. um rather than actually testing for the real reason of testing which is as i say to i think to invalidate as much as you can in order to validate certain things so you can move on in the right direction yeah. i think confirmation bias is the is like the number one one of them i was going to say one of the number ones <laughs> it's the number one. <laughs> I agree. It's also one of the number ones. It's up there, um, right? It's, it's up like there. an ego thing, isn't it? As well, like you know, you and one of the big things I speak to founders about when I take them through accelerator programs or work with them, don't be worried. I kill your darlings. Don't be worried about failure because often it's not the idea that's got you into the, into the incubator. It's actually you as a person and your approach and actually being able to turn around and go, do you know what? I've invalidated this, but these are the things I've learned on my way. I've seen people, you know, get continual chunks of cash from funders. And they've gone, actually, we said we were setting out to do X, Y, and Z. And we haven't achieved any of those things, but these are the things we've learned and this is the pivot. And you're just constantly getting closer to what you, sh- you want to achieve. If you are, if you're naive enough, I'm going to be, I'm going to be harsh now. If you're naive enough and egotistical enough to literally just have a blinkered view when you think that your idea is just that boss, that it's just going to fly and you're not going to have to change it in any way, shape or form. Good luck to you. Because... <laughs> You're going to be, I know you're like harsh words on a Friday morning. This is why we normally do this at lunchtime. I'm far nicer by lunchtime. <laughs> look, look, you're right. You're right. Yeah. You're, you're, yeah, I, I totally agree. Ego, ego, ego is like, ego is the enemy, right? And um, yeah. it is in so many walks of life again, um, but it totally gets in the way of, of creating a great great startup we fall in love with our problem fall in love with the solutions right and we think that there's this um this um you know we've been working on this for so long so therefore we've got to carry on right yeah um the what's the what's the fallacy what's the the build fallacy what's the what's it called Um, sunk sunk cost fallacy there we go Yeah. yeah Sunk cost yeah. bias, sunk cost fallacy. Yeah, yeah, you know, we've been working on this idea for so long. We've got to carry on with it. Exactly. But honestly, like, if it's going to fail, the best time you could have stopped it was yesterday or a month ago or the next best time to stop it is today, right? Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, that's yeah, where yeah. the honesty and the kindness 
comes in. Exactly. And I think even from like a, a psychological perspective, your ego is there to keep you safe. So when I'm saying, you know, it's, it's your ego at play, there, there is that like brash bravado kind of like arrogance piece potentially, but also from an ego perspective, you don't want to poke the bear. If the bear, you know, if you poke the bear and the shit hits the fan, you're like, oh man. So sometimes it's just easier and safer to live in this like little like naive bubble, isn't it? And just be like, oh no, we've done, we've done the box ticking exercise of the experiments, like you say, and we've proven things and we've spoken to people and they've all said it's fantastic and not followed things like the bomb test principle. Then you're just blindly carrying on. So yeah, it is, yeah. You, you need to have a good word with yourself and find out what you're doing and why you're doing it. Absolutely. Definitely. And it probably leads us on to the next, my next point that I want to talk about today. So the second point here is that for me, execution is so much more important than ideas. Execution really beats mm -hmm. ideas in a race. It's not about the idea. The idea is going to change to your point. If you've got that, if you've got that perspective that you've got the world beating idea and that's the only thing that matters, then you're probably going to fail. You're probably not set up for success ideas can start shit and can build into something great but it's very difficult to do shit execution even if you've got a great idea it's never going to work yeah. so you know even if you've got a great idea of execution falls short it's going to fail but a rubbish idea with great execution especially if that execution is about learning then eventually you're going to get to the point where it's going to be something which is which is awesome. And when I talk about execution, I'm not just talking about building. I'm talking mm -hmm. about learning as well. Yep. It's about, you know, having the having the tools and the approaches in place so that you are executing in a way such that you're continuing to learn and develop on this this idea uh, and pivoting and changing and and completely changing direction when needed, you know, killing yep. things off. At an early stage is far far more e far easier than having something bloom into a horrible monster <laughs> i think have you have you got triffids in your garden is that <laughs> <laughs> um i, I, know, and I couldn't I agree more i mean <laughs> there's a few things in that so um there is so if, if you haven't read this um, you will have read this but if people haven't read this book like this talks about um, one of the stories is it dog deets from ge capital and it's either mri scanners or ct scanners and i always use this right, story right, right, right. Yeah, and the fact yeah. that they built it was you know a billion dollar department it won awards it was like game changing and he went there and saw you know kids having to be anesthetized to use the fucking thing because they're all petrified so even if you have the most awesome idea which solves the thing but is not user friendly and causes prob and people have problems using it it's not going to float and they had to go back to the drawing board about that do a little design thinking do a little research and now they have kid themed ones where there's a story that you're going on a rocket ship and everything's rocket ship themed or there's Lego toys where you can play with it so kids understand it. They don't just think they're getting like shot to the moon in some scary thing. You know, even when I laid an MRI scanner last time, I genuinely lay there for an hour waiting to be shot out like I was in a rocket of some kind. Like it just it's your brain plays funny things on you. Um, so I think there's that, isn't it? That, you know, that that pivoting, but also you might have a great idea, you might have a great solution. And so I was talking to a founder the other day um, and he's got an amazing tool. It's been downloaded loads um, it, on the face of it. Awesome. But I'm saying to him like, okay, well, what does your, what does your um, retention look like? How frequently, how easily does someone get to that aha moment or that um, when we spoke about the Facebook thing the other week, like when it becomes mm -hmm. like sticky and interesting. So the tool itself might be fantastic, but if someone doesn't get to benefit of it quickly, they don't see it. It's like a gym membership. Like unless you start to see some change or you enjoy the environment and get into a pattern of going, it's just a really costly thing that eventually will just get cut from your budget. So someone needs to get it and they need to, you know, so your initial idea still might be like a fulcrum of the solution, but it needs so much other stuff. And it might be, you know, that there's training videos or a better onboarding process or whatever it is. And those are things that are constantly tweaking, iterating, etc. It's not just build and forget. It's that constant testing iteration. So, you know, your sales approach, your marketing, your onboarding, your payment approach, 
you know, anything like that, how you get referrals, how you spread the gospel, there's so much stuff and it should just be a constant evolving iteration. Like, it, you know, experiments are essential for the whole of your business. It's not just a case of like, let's test the idea in its infancy, do a couple of wireframes. Yeah, people like the concept of it and actually they can get to and they can navigate to the thing they need to navigate to. You, you need to constantly have feedback, like build that shit into your app. You know, whether it be, there's loads of different tools out there, Hotjar, for example, whatever. You need analytics from day one to find out what people are doing because don't go, mm. there's loads of downloads here. Amazing, we're doing really well. And then just fire and forget and think I'll just throw a load of marketing money at it because if people aren't, aren't utilizing it, converting and being retained, you just, you may as well go and burn a load of cash outside or send it to me. I'll spend yeah. it on something interesting. It'll be as, as beneficial to you. <laughs> Down in the comments, hit up Rebecca on LinkedIn, all the socials. She's out there. Exactly. You Let's get Rebecca to money. Bali. Bex in Bali. There you go. <laughs> There's the campaign. That's the new, new campaign. Bex to Bali. What you're talking about there, I think of as um, kind of speed to value. So mm. reducing the speed to customer or user value is as small as possible. And that could be, it might not be like the big value that they will see if they work in that work out in the gym for 12 months, but what's the way that they're going to get value the very first day? What's the experience that you want to create that gives someone that boost that kind of gets them to remember that next time they're thinking, Oh shit, do I want to go to the gym or not? What's the boost? What's the, what's the feeling that you can try to replicate? And I think there's this, there's this really great concept. And I, I think I learned this from one of the Y Combinator, like eight, ages ago in a Y Combinator series of lectures that, that they did. This was the founder of um, like Woof, Woof Forms or something like that they were called. I can't remember okay, what it was, yeah. like one of the early internet form kind of companies. And it's this Japanese concept, which is about, there's two expressions. One is, I'm going to get the language wrong. So apologies for any Japanese speakers out there, because this will be uh, horrible Kanichiwa. hearing. hearing this. But Konnichiwa, there we go. <laughs> Antirame Hinshitsu and Murikata, Murikateki Hinshitsu. So one of them, the Antirame Hinshitsu, that I think, if my memory is right, is like, is a taken for granted quality. It's nice. a pen that writes it's a you know it's it's just like it does the job it's table stakes but it yep. does the job in a way that kind of gets that job done you know um but the other one the murio kateki um hinshitsu that's like an enchanting quality and nice. this is the the piece of you know ux or the piece of your experience that just wows and surprises and delights people um and that idea i think is really interesting where you go well the fundamental job to be done for people might be to get fit, live healthier lives, right? Yep. But actually, what's an, a piece of wow moment and delight and surprise that we can provide for people that's going to mean that they're much more likely to come back and carry on with that journey and get getting to that ultimate goal? Yep. Um, and I think that's a really interesting kind of dynamic. Now, one of the other things to think about here is there's another thing called the Carnot model. I don't know if you're from like know about the Carnot mm. model, which is it's basically this idea of like, again, table stakes and, and delighters. Eventually what happens is that those things that are delighters that surprise people, they eventually become the table stakes because okay. Because it just becomes something where you're familiar with, it becomes natural, it becomes part of your everyday everyday world. So you need to then reinvent and kind of reimagine and innovate around things that are going to surprise new people again. Yes. And I think it's that it, it basically there's like a curve of 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 those delighters continuing to de delight. They have a short shelf life sometimes yeah. because of other things that are going on. So I think it's a in the early stage, it's like find those find those things that are going to wow and surprise and delight, whilst also continuing to get the value yes. that people are really looking for, provide the value that people are looking for. But it doesn't stop there. It needs to be continuous, continuously um, looked at again. Well, you see that with phones, don't you? Like I just in, in like basic terms, I want something that's got good connectivity and decent battery life, and I can probably drop it at least a billion times before it smashes. Those are my criteria. But like, that's not what it sells on. Like I get a new Samsung every so often. I'm like, okay, boss, like I can take pictures of the moon from my house. Fantastic. 
do I ever fucking use it? No. But that's what draws people in, but isn't you it? Need like, it. Kind of... You need it. You need it when you're buying that. God, I can't believe I've got a phone that doesn't take a picture of the bloody moon. I know. I'm like, what do you mean you haven't got six lenses on the back of this camera? This is ridiculous. <laughs> I can't cope under these circumstances. Do I ever use it to its full potential? No. Like it is, I remember Simon getting um, on the Google phones when they first came out and there were some beautiful like landscaping things. And, you know, there was, um, it was before a lot of like the augmented reality stuff came out and it was just like mind blowing. Uh, we used it for about 10 minutes, totally forgot about it. Like it just, but that was the draw. That's the thing that set it apart in the marketplace because like you say, like the basic stuff is just expected. Yeah. Yeah, it is absolutely yeah. it is it is just is go. i don't know where i was going with that i was just yeah. like it is it is <laughs> end okay let's move on should we move on yes yes point i think we've we've kind of probably po covered most of these points but i'm going to talk okay. about another one maybe we've talked about it already point three for me is learning beats building and sometimes we it's, again one of those traps that's so easy to fall into is go I've got a bit of evidence I'm going to go and build this thing. And we did that way too early. We built the very first course, as I talked about a minute ago. Um, but the next things that we started to build were, were apps, web apps. But then I, we decided to build a iOS native app. Okay. Even before like we'd got a thing to work just on a website in a way completely the wrong, the wrong order of things, wasted a whole load of money in that way. We hadn't learned. We hadn't built anything and learnt from it. We would build and then we wanted to build and then we wanted to build and yeah. then we wanted to build. And again, like I know this stuff, right? I knew it back then, but it's still so easy to fall into the trap of it because that's it feels like the thing that you've got to do is get more more output. Yeah. Build more stuff, Momentum. create more things. Yeah. Momentum. It feels like it's a it feels like the right thing to be doing at the time, but the reality of it is that you just need to be continuing to learn. So you should be building to learn, not learning to build. Learning to build is fine. You need to ha have those people that can build stuff within your organization, but actually you need to build in order to be able to learn more as you go as well. So again, it's kind of reaff reaffirming that point of, yeah. of testing really. But I think that's across the board as well. And it's kind of like that, that do less better approach. So I, you know, we've got a mutual friend, Sean, and that is his mantra to me. Every time I'm like, I'm thinking about doing the thing, he's like, do less better. And like, okay, I'll come back with my refined version. But it's, you know, in terms of like a sales approach, like don't think about what you've learned from the feedback you've got. If you haven't sold it to person X, is that because the approach wasn't right? They weren't the right customer for you. Like ask the questions, was the price point all wrong? You know, reflect back consider it because otherwise you're just burning through whereas you're burning through resources with building you're burning through opportunity by selling things in the wrong way um you know and i know a couple of people and it's been really beautiful actually recently i've been speaking to just consultants and they're like i tried selling it this way and i tried selling it that way and that was like a no-brainer for somebody and it's like brilliant you split tested your sales approach on a micro scale when you've had two conversations in the case of a week amazing rather than just going oh well that wasn't the right person for that again like i'm still right in my approach let's just crack on it's not it's not the right yeah. way to do it you know be reflective take those learnings on board um and it doesn't need to be you don't have to have all the answers as well it's like okay i feel like there's a problem here like what's the advice out there you know there's people like us there's people on the internet there's loads of books there's loads of people who've done these things before you can put your ego to one side and kind of like ask for a bit of help um yeah i think there's that iterative approach to everything is so key and there's you know there's an ash moria quote where in the case of like the the job of an entrepreneur or startup founder is to validate the business model not necessarily the product because again you can get the perfect business you can get the perfect product through this iteration and people feel more comfortable with that because it's something tangible to experiment against and there's tools etc but actually, you know, do landing pages about your pricing approach or have different conversations or, you know, just change things up because yeah. those small tweaks will infinitely, they'll shave time off your sales process, you'll get more results, you'll get better conversions, etc. And whether that's in-person sales or, you know, if you're doing stuff where it's a SaaS platform and essentially you just onboard people through a, an automated process, there's so much stuff to learn that is really, really mm. essential. Yeah, absolutely. And it leads me back onto another point. One of my fourth points is 
business models are non-negotiable. Yeah. Um, you know, we failed to find a viable business model. We didn't. We tested a couple of different business models, but we failed to find the one quickly enough. And it's a race, right? A startup when you've got when you've got funding, it's a race between finding basically product market fit or an early indicator of product market fit to the point where you can either sell in order to get more money, well, sell to either a customer or sell to a to a funder, right? To someone yeah. who's going to give, give you some money. So you need to be able to get to the point where you can sell to either one of those people before your money runs out, before yes. your runway kind of ends. And, and these I think just today it's even like, more important. Yeah. Well, a lot of, so a lot of angels and, and VCs are, you know, they want monetization. They want sales. Exactly. So you, to sell to the VC or the angel, you have to have made the sale to the common man. And sometimes they're letters of intent because it's too early doors, but realistically you have to have proven the business model, proven the viability of this, this concept. Um, because yeah, you can, might be able to build anything, but if you can't sell the fucker, like good night Vienna. Exactly. And also the business model isn't just about, you know, you've seen this with, with the lean canvas or the business model canvas. It's not just about revenue and costs. That's not the business model. The business model is the whole, all of the things that you're going to do. How are you going to find your customers? What are the channels you're going to be using? What's your unique value, value proposition that stands out yeah. in maybe a crowded market or in a new market? You know, what's your operational stuff that you need to be able to do? You need to, you need to plan and map out that whole that whole world so that you can really understand the direction of travel that you want to be going in and test each of those things. As you say, test your sales approach, test your different channels for acquisition, test, yeah. of course, your product uh, positioning as well as what your product does and onboarding or anything like that. All of these things, you know, it's constant experimentation, right? Infinite. Yeah. We need to be infinite experimenters, I think. I love that. And the thing yeah. is, like, make sure that... So I was talking to someone recently and their premise was that to essentially have a free service and then they would get a kickback from the person that was essentially receiving the booking at the end. But, you know, you've got to understand. So I, I know that that kickback exists, but what that is in terms of, a, of the, like the, the, the margin or the amount against a booking You've got to look at like how much it's going to cost to get people in the top of your funnel. How quickly can you convert them, or what percentage you're going to convert them? And then that minutia kit back. How many of those do you need to even make this business viable? I know a lot of people are like, oh, I'll just sell advertising on the platform; it'll be free. Well, are the kind of people that are the kind of advertisers that those type of people want to see interested in that? You know, if it's just a case of like Mackies and Costa and God knows what, like just advertising at me, it's going to be, I'm not interested. So say, for example, I'm looking mm. at, you know, some kind of like adventuring app. Well, I want people who are relevant to me. I want kind of like outdoorsy brands. I want this kind of thing. I don't want like Asda, you know, make sure there's alignment there and they're prepared to pay. Because if it's smaller yeah. niche boutique brands that fit with your kind of like brand ethos, but they haven't got the money to be paying for the advertising, you haven't got a business model. Doesn't work. You can't just go, I'll right. sell advertising place and it'll be fine. You need to make sure these things are aligned because people won't tolerate having stuff shoved down their throat that they're not interested in. They'll very quickly turn off. Absolutely. So partnerships, I guess that partnerships point on, on the canvases is so, so, so critical. Uh, and partnerships are uh, you know, far broader than we often think about partnerships as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. My fifth point, if I can jump onto that, is, and I, and I mentioned this right at the beginning. Go on. Something, Sorry, something I just had like a brainwave. Like there was one last thing oh. um, just before we leave that last point. Because I was speaking to a guy Capture the other day it. and he had a really lovely app. Um, and I'm like, I'm going to do some work on it for equity, like I, I wholeheartedly believe in it. I often do like pro bono stuff or like for equity. Um, and essentially he's, this tool is gonna to be free. A lot of information is gonna be crowdsourced. And I was like, well, okay, well, how are you gonna fund it? We can sell an API to the functionality to a totally different industry who are interested. No, none of his B2C customers ever need to know about that, but there's an intrinsic commercial value to the algorithm and the tool that he has built that someone in a totally different field appreciates, which means then actually this app, even just in the short term, it's like a form of bootstrapping. He'll sell that, 
these people will use it, that gives them the money, the runway, etc., to, you know, get the traction, get the people on it, get the crowdsourcing, get the quality information within the application that's customer facing, and then he can bring the other revenue streams on board in time. But people need to come to the party and be having a good time in the kitchen before he can start charging to go in the champagne room, or I don't know. I lost, I lost the end of that analogy. <laughs> fell off slightly. We don't it have happens, champagne it in our house, by the way. <laughs> but uh, you know, quick one. Go on. On champagne, it was our yes. wedding anniversary yesterday. Ah, congratulations! And which was lovely. We opened a bottle of champagne that we've had for a while. Yeah. It was a really nice bottle of Bollinger or something. Nice. And it had gone off. So, yes, this is the whole thing. So, me and my old housemate, yeah, we used to have Champagne Thursdays, um, often Prosecco Thursdays, to be fair. Like, I don't know, (laughs) Paris Hilton days. Um, But our our rationale was Champagne goes off. So, you've got to drink it. Champagne goes off, yeah. Yeah. I I, kind of knew that, but we, we, (laughs) we actually wasted four bottles of Champagne. We opened, we've got... Like outside you our house right now. You're bougie as fuck if you've got four proper. bottles of champagne kicking around. We've had four bottles of champagne in our house because we just don't drink champagne and we've had it for, and like we're like, oh, special occasion, special occasion, special occasion, sun's out, you know, anniversary, let's get the champagne out, let's treat ourselves, you know, yeah. we'll get the posh cutlery, that kind of thing, you know. Um, <laughs> we don't have posh cutlery, but hey. Um, and all four bottles had gone off. Oh, or at least no. like, yeah, like, and do you know what we ended up with? Go on. A rosé prosecco, bloody brilliant. Loved it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can say my hack would have been just put some chambord in the champagne, and it'll yeah, be and fine. Yeah, oh, there you go. Champ. Yes, chambord. You're right. You're right. That could have. That could have. Which, worked. But that's but no, essentially then like rosé prosecco, like slightly yeah, buried, yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know, same alcohol. <laughs> exactly. Never Love waste that. the champagne. Love champagne. It's gone. It's gone now. And I was quite happy with doing it. I haven't got a problem with that. But there's two things that I wanted to talk about with your point about your the guy that's or the, the, the founder that's selling the API and getting yes. something for free. First point is by the guys at Basecamp. And they often or used to talk a lot about reusing your waste. So the oh, things that nice. you create on the journey towards creating the thing that you're going to launch with and the customer facing thing what are the things that you've built along the way that you could reuse and actually that's kind of what slack was right slack okay. was the same thing it was the founders were building a game and they'd also yes. built this communication tool and they spun that out it's almost like their waste the stuff that they needed to build along the way and Basecamp do that a lot with their books and their content and whatever else they're telling these yes. stories they're documenting this stuff and um and that's kind of using their their waste product along the journey of whatever they're creating and the second point that i wanted to make was it sounds like the kind of elon musk strategy with tesla in a way because i can't remember exactly i've i i did a video about this ages ago but i can't remember exactly what it was but essentially by building the cars model three or whatever else they're also they're actually innovating a huge amount in the batteries and actually it happens a lot with cars yes. It's the battery. They became a basically a battery company. And that battery company is the thing that they can sell to other people that means that they can get to the next point of nice. the next car that they want, reduce the costs. So they're basically yes. selling the things, the component parts that build up the overall thing that they're launching with to different people, B2, B2B kind of routes. And I think that's a really, it's such a great method. And actually, I wish I'd had someone like that when I were doing doing future builders because we were doing a, one of the business models we were trying to figure out actually i haven't even told you what what it actually ended up being right no. but essentially it was a it was a learning app and i had this i as i said i brought my own confirmation about this idea my um this own bias sorry about this idea and tried to confirm it which was i believed that people um i was a learning person at the time i was a, like learning designer or whatever and my kind of hypothesis was in the future, we will be able to learn stuff without needing a learning designer to curate a learning experience. Okay. Everything's out there. It's all out there on the internet. We can go and find all this stuff. How do I basically get rid of myself by giving people what they need when they need it? So depending on where you are in your journey, the direction that you want to move towards and the stuff that you want to learn, this system will automatically go, here's the thing about that topic here's the thing that you need to know in order to be able to do that really well so if you think of a startup journey of founders yeah so an interesting idea right turns out it's been done a bunch now 
And so the idea probably wasn't bad, but the execution was. Um, what we tried to do is when we did a lot of experimentation, by the way, we did we did 10 landing pages with one that mm-hmm. being one of them for 10 completely different concepts and saw how many people signed up. We got we got metrics on who's clicking the button to, like, find out more to give us their yep. email address. So it was a really good landing page test. That one got 10 uh, times see, more people. But for me, just to interrupt, like that is a that's a value proposition in a marketing thing. Like, I yeah. don't care how you do the thing. I want the output. I want the learning. I want the knowledge. I want the empowerment. I don't really care if you send me a chicken who can talk to me in French and somehow is going to psychically land concepts in my brain. Couldn't, I don't care less. I want the output. So <clears throat> if I saw a landing page, it was like, do you want a chicken sending through the post? Or do you want this, like, you know an amalgamated app that does da, 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 da. And I'm like, well, obviously the app, but that's not, if the chicken was better, right. faster, smarter, it's a, like this cocoa pop thing is just carrying on this weirdness, isn't it? Um, Think on with and you. that's the whole thing. Like, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like I don't, it's don't sell. So um, again, like Sean, you know, it's all about the afters. What's the output? Like, you know, selling with empathy. You've got to understand people's problems, frustrations, the symptoms of their pains, etc., and then make it easy for them to achieve their goal. They don't necessarily need to know the the what. They need just need to know what's right. gonna. You see what I mean? It's not it's not how you've yeah, done yeah, it. It's yeah, like yeah, people yeah. are like, oh, it's a blockchain solution with. But I don't I don't care. I was talking to another founder no. the other day, and she was like, well, we're thinking about doing it on the blockchain. I was like, fine, but don't tell your audience that. Right. Like fantastic in the fact that um, you know tell your this, investors, this, but don't you don't need to tell your your, your exactly users. don't tell the audience because they'll just be like oh that feels like you know thirty thirty five technology I don't want to know I just want to know that the um, the pet I've bought is the right pet and she was totally right to be doing the things that she was doing and actually blockchain is the solution for her her audience don't need to know that. In the mm-hmm. it's not of importance, it's not of interest, because it's just yeah. like if I know I can buy my groceries and they're going to turn up on a certain day, or I can make a payment through a website, I don't need to someone who told me, well, it's based in AWS and we've done this thing and da 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 da, da and there's this data layer, and I don't care, I don't care, I just want Absolutely. the outcome, I want my groceries to yeah. turn up on a Friday morning so I don't have to go to the shops. Yeah. So, Absolutely. Yeah. But it's got to be specific as well. One of the one of the messages that we led with was was basically like learn anything from anywhere to any level. And like, that's fine. Yeah. You kind of go, oh, yeah, that'd be nice. But then it's not specific enough. It's not it's not yeah. solving the, the burning challenge, the burning problem that people really have at that point in time. So, I mean, but, but, but we did this, right? We did this 10 landing pages. We got a lot of this is what I mean about validating my assumptions, my beliefs, my firmly held beliefs, because it was like, well, that one got 10x the signups yeah. than all of the others put together. So surely that's the direction that we move in. So we did. Yeah. But then we went through an, another round of testing where we tested what should be the price point. If this is a B2C, should we have a free version? Should we have a price point? We did a, a bunch of landing page, more landing page tests with a price. Basically sign up for $6, $10, $15, $30 a month. And we got people to give us their money. So this is the thing, like they had signed up with Stripe, they'd given us their money, we'd had, and we ended up refunding everyone because it failed. Um, but, you know, we got people to give us money. It ranged at about 6 to $9 a month that people felt yeah. like this was enough, the right kind of price point or whatever, and that was great. But what we wanted to do was we didn't really want to charge people directly. We wanted to charge businesses. So we had a B2B2C route, which was let's give it away for free, and then we'll get people to get a, um, a business subscription that yeah. has some unique features. And all again, all kind of sounds interesting. It sounds like it could it could work really well, but um, it failed. Like, and it failed for a bunch of reasons. At that point, a the team that I'm going to talk about disappeared. So it was me, um, yeah. and so I, you know, was a CEO at that point. CEO of a company that of no one of just me which okay. is another point I'm going to talk about. It seems strange to have a CEO with no staff. Um, looking back, um, 
<laughs> but I went, I went heavily into the B2B world and did a whole load of experiments with B2B and then completely, basically, basically had this thing that we'd launched, we'd built and we just never launched it. We never yeah. launched it because we ran out of money because I was focusing on the B2B route instead of just building up an audience. And because of like, yeah. there were so many pressures at the time of fundraising, losing money, whatever else. Um, yeah, definitely a big challenge. Well, I think there's, I think there's a couple of things in that I think like, like massive kudos on testing those ideas and proving price points and all that kind of stuff like that's incredibly important but I think the step beforehand is making sure that the medium on which you solve someone's problem is the right thing and the product or the offering as in the tangible thing that they they use and interact with is the right thing and then it's the testing the price points the, 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 the messaging the the value proposition or the kind of like yeah how you make that thing land in terms of your marketing copy so I think all those things are like spot on they're definitely stuff to be doing but if you haven't got that mechanism to solve the problem in the first instance um what was going to be my other point no it's drifted out my brain it might come back in a minute about people people oh yes it's really like so a, a, a concept I'd learnt about and then forgotten but was you know wonderfully refreshed in my brain the other day when I was speaking to somebody and this is why I love like talking to other people in the community the concept of having a hipster hacker and a hustler on your team mm. like people who fulfill those roles because you can't do everything you can't wear all the hats and in terms of that like hacker is like you know someone who can help and it might not be they actually build anything but they, they're they're responsible for the product and making it work and land and you know it might be a case of you use a load of existing functionality in terms of like a prototype or a proof of concept but they're responsible for that you've got the hustler who's about the money you know speaking to the investors moving this forward as a commercial entity and then you've got the hipster who is about understanding the audience the marketing making sure things resonate and land understanding the needs it's kind of like the people person and i think that for one person to try and achieve all those things is impossible yeah you're right and, and we, we broadly had that in the organization mm -hmm. the problem that we had was um we we were, we were we were looking at this startup in completely different directions or at it from completely different directions with the intention of going in a, in completely different directions as well and so one of the problems was that the at that stage I, I, yeah i'm going to i'm going to say it like at that stage everyone needs to be working to build out what this company is rather than to work be working you know, you need to be working in the company, not on the company, yeah. right? Yeah, so yeah, I think yeah, there's a big difference. Yeah, yeah, you've got to get your hands dirty. You've got to be, and like, and the CEO that we had at the time was basically, I'm going to work on the company. I'm working, yeah. like making sure the company is doing what it should be doing. I'm going to be, you know, rather than being, what we needed was him to be the hustler. We needed him to yeah. be getting out there, selling, you know, talking to customers and whatever else. Um, to talking to customers for, from a financial perspective and yeah. route, but not that, that that wasn't happening. So this right, company okay. basically became quite toxic. There were three of us, and what happened was there was all, in, in any moment of decision there was always it was always two against one, and right, those okay. two against ones always changed around. So I happened to always be in a pair rather than good. kind of the one that was on my own, which was good, but it yeah. al always felt like I was ganging up on somebody else, right? Right, okay. Uh, with yeah. every single decision that we made. And um, and it was just toxic. It just didn't it yeah. didn't work. You need to have people who, A, are working, you know, within the business to try to, to, to do what needs to be done, what needs to be done, particularly around experimentation and learning. Um, but also you need to be, you need to be working with people that you, a love to be around that you trust that you want to go for a drink with afterwards yep. that you're ready to do anything for and we just didn't we didn't have that that okay. closeness and that bond and that's one of the lessons for me that's stuck with me the most out of this whole experience is you know I want to be working with people that I I love both clients and and collaborators and partners and whatever else as well yeah. I just I haven't got time for toxicity I haven't got time for people being dicks 
yeah. and um, and I think that's one of, one of the biggest lessons that I've that I've learned on that journey as well. How just out of interest, how did you how did that team come together? Because I see a lot of people where they they go out and recruit people. It's almost like collecting Pokemons. They're like, I've got this person's interested, but they're not bought in at the same level. And then when, you know, there's money that needs to be spent or there's time and resource, essentially that person expected to just be a figurehead, for example, and purely advisory, but there wasn't that conversation in the first instance about, you know, how how much in, in the game they were. Um, and also, you know, people start businesses with friends, but they're not necessarily the, the best equipped. So it's quite a difficult thing to kind of work out how to work with people and who to work with so how did that team form yeah so there was a it was a it was a normal hiring process to find the, oh, okay. the ceo so founders factory hired the ceo in like a in a regular recruitment round basically right. of trying to find you know trying to find them yeah. and then he kind of went out and tried to find the cto and cpo basically right okay. um so Would yeah you can- it, which is fine and it sometimes works out really well like that but there was definitely a feeling that we weren't we weren't all coming from the same place and weren't as equally invested in it as everyone else yeah. so there was still there was definitely that tension of like well just because you started a month before me why do you get that much more equity than me you know okay. it's those kind of questions yeah. that were kind of revolving yeah. around people's heads and stuff like that so but even for businesses raised I was going to about to say even for businesses raised only a quarter of a million pounds, which just sounds like ludicrous. But to be fair, it's kind of like small fry. Um, yeah. That they are very formalized roles. And the fact that they recruited for makes me think they were paid. Like normally when you're in that, like, you know, I've had conversations with founders where they're like, well, I get paid like 80 grand a year. So I expect that to be my salary. N- no, a lot of VCs, you know, a lot of angels will not tolerate that. It's a case of enough to kind of like pay your mortgage, cover your bills. I mean, we used to look at about 30, 35 grand for a salary for a founder because you're putting in your time for your equity and then you'll get the payoff in the long run. So you're skin in the game. You're not turning up to a 95. And it's far, if you're coming in with that I'm employed mindset as well, and it's just like, oh, well, I've done my best today. Hey ho, another day tomorrow kind of thing. I shut my laptop. It doesn't work like that. And I'm totally against the bro culture. Like, you know, I see founders achieve far more when they do less and they spend time away from their business and have that, that balance. And it's better for their sanity, resilience, creativity, all these good things. But also, you need to be hustling. You need to be like, right, what? It doesn't matter what's needed. I'm going to do the thing that's needed to make this work. Not like, what's my job spec? And even that, that hipster hacker hustler thing, like those things will switch. You'll have to go mm. and you know, everyone should be speaking to customers. Everyone should be considering, you know, the business model, all these things. It's kind of like shared responsibility. And I think sometimes, yeah, when there's too much formalization and people try and operate startups like, proper little businesses or corporates that they've worked in in the past with a clear delineation of responsibilities it doesn't work because it's not at that stage no. yet you know you've got to no, be no. you know decent turnover and you'll have seen from that startup you took to a million quid like at that point you know you are formalizing stuff because there's true requirements there there are customers to services it's, you have to kind of like segment things out and have responsibilities but it's like that um analogy like if you in terms of startup opportunities, if someone says to you, do you want to get on the rocket ship? You don't ask what seat you're taking. You just get on the fucking rocket ship. You'll work it out when you're up there. And when things get start to get interesting, then you will naturally fall to your area of interest or your you know experience, etc. But just get in, get your hands dirty and make things work because otherwise the thing will die. Like, I yeah. think that's brilliant. You're totally right. And, and I, I think even further than that, I would think, I think there's a fundamental problem and I, I don't i don't know i'm interested to hear your thoughts on this but anyone else's as well i think there's a fundamental problem with the with the titles that we give ourselves as startup founders yeah. there's a massive difference between a founder and a ceo in my in my view a founder yes. is someone who is the hustler they are testing they're scrappy they're getting things going they're ex- exploring constantly you know what's working what's not what what are the opportunities what are the space we need to walk, occupy that's the fundamental job of a founder is the chief experimenter, you know, 
Yeah. And it shouldn't be the chief executive officer. You're an ex- executive of what? Like, you haven't got anything. You haven't got any people. Exactly. You haven't got a product. You haven't got any money. What are you executing executive of? And it just yeah. makes no sense. Chief product officer, chief technical officer. These are just inflated roles, in my opinion, that don't really serve any purpose at that point. They're the roles that you need when you've got product market fit and you're looking to exploit the business model that you've kind of you've you've kind of created and yeah. you've explored and you've learned about. So I just don't think that I don't think that startups I don't know, like, what are your thoughts on that? I, I mean, my, you know, I feel, feel pretty um, strongly about that now. I think the title is potentially important or interesting in terms of gravitas when speaking to customers. I get that. But in terms of your responsibility and, yeah, so I know, like, chief product officers who work on, you know, run huge teams and they have a very different strategic view on the roadmap. But often, and hopefully, they've come up through the ranks, so they totally understand the different roles. Things will evolve and change because it's been a while since they've been on the tools, but they should still be practitioners at heart. And I think it's a whole thing, like, you know, like my other half, the reason why his, his technical teams love him and he's a senior consultant, or whatever his title is, I'm sure he'll get upset and he'll be like, I'm an architect now. But he knows, like, if someone's like, I can't make this thing work, well, he just gets in the code and fixes it. Because he's got 20 odd years of technical knowledge where he can, he'll eat, you know, if someone wants to learn, he will sit next to them and teach them. If someone wants something fixing and it's out of their thing, right, fine, like, let me fix it right now and then I'll show you how I've done it. Like, be the person who is still prepared to do the things, not just be like, well, that. I think we need an intern or we need a... That's the thing. When people come to these roles and then just say to people who aren't as knowledgeable as they are about technical stuff or product, who start to say, well, that's not really my remit and we need people who... Dun, 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 dun. And it's like, oh, okay, right. Now I've got to... Oh, yeah, okay. And that's the thing. Non-technical founders quite often have this. Like, you just need a good technical person by your side or a good product person who's just going to fucking build some shit for you. Like, mm. it doesn't have to be beautiful it doesn't look perfect it just sort of get you to the next level not a case of like we'll sit here and pontificate about like what minions can we hire who can actually do the delivery right. bullshit like yeah. just get the thing moving you know and it doesn't have to be a hundred thousand pound a uh, technical person you employ like go and get you know hire somebody or work with somebody who's you know doing their a levels who's really technically much savvy and can build some stuff from existing things and knows how to tack stuff together with sticky glue and you know get you something that gets you out there and learning and testing and developing you know that person might not be the person who in the same way that the founder might be the person who takes you to you need to go from founder to a CEO towards an exit or like massive scale, that first initial technical person doesn't have to be the person who will lead right, teams right, right, right. eventually. Just do what you need. And that's that lean principles. Do what, Use what you can and what you can afford to get the most results to get you as far as you can at any time because you don't have the luxury of hiring people grandiose titles like you know let's have go for fun, fancy lunches and we've been we've been funded 20 you know 250 grand like let's just do what we did in corporates don't work like that. yeah you're right back no, you're, snakes you're totally back, right. You're right back down to the bottom yeah they're completely different roles for me completely different roles either the founder and ceo completely different roles i think you know first technical hire or co-founder completely different role to running a big engineering team same with product product manager product leader that has a bunch of heads of products and product managers beneath them completely different role to a first person looking at product for a startup right it's a completely different role and i'm not saying that you can't develop and learn both of those worlds i'm not saying you can't go from a founder to a ceo you can you absolutely can but you've got to realize that they're a completely it's a completely different role so um I think that's a that's an important thing. Maybe a place for us to finish because this has been a it's been a long one. I will add one last one. thing in terms oh. of like don't well just like fractional roles. So you might need somebody. So maybe you're a year into your business, two years into your business, and actually things are starting to go well, but you still can't afford someone full time. Get a fractional CTO in. 
like I work with a guy, Rob, you know, as part of Baltic Ventures, he'll come in do a couple of days a month or he'll do, um, he will do like a, a sound check, like an MOT on your tech stack, how you've built it and help you work on your roadmap, which then, you know, in terms of investor perspective, like it's robust. You know what the approach is, you know where you're going to spend your money, you know what you need to do to make this thing scalable so it doesn't have to be you know you can still get the skill sets into your business as and when you need them without the huge price tag as well so that would be another bit of advice that's a great shout that's a that's a much better place to end this proper advice (laughs) a shout out to rob hello rob (laughs) hi rob don't know you but hey i should definitely know you (laughs) Okay, awesome. I think this has been awesome. it's been a chunky episode, but I think it's it's yeah, this should be feels a awesome like an important episode. one. And yes, I'm glad. Really Thank you for you for listening to me, Bex, and anyone else that has listened. <laughs> this me get this off my chest. It feels quite <laughs> cathartic. I feel like a weight has been taken yeah. off me and uh yeah. But the thing is you've gone on to bigger and better things. Like it's been the springboard to other stuff, which has helped shape your learning, shaped your path, and actually probably got you something that you're, you love doing f- infinitely more than that. So I think this is the thing, like, people be like, oh, I failed a startup, like, oh, from an ego perspective, or like, what do I do? Like, ooh, you know, carry around that baggage. No, like, take the learnings, jib the rest, and then crack on with your life. Like, go and do bigger, brighter, better things. Always. There we go. Always. So Friday optimism. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful what a great way to finish um bex thank you so much have a wonderful weekend it's going to be a pretty too. special one i think um so yeah enjoy and anyone else that's listening let us know which of those lessons you think is is, is there one that you've learned you've had to learn the hard way and is there something that stands out for you as the most important one for repeating if something really resonated final shout out is share this episode share the love mm-hmm. You know it's important for us. It's important for everyone to get these these lessons and hard truths sometimes. So if it's valuable for you, maybe it's valuable for someone else as well. Exactly. There you go. That's like a little Jerry Springer moment at the end, doesn't it? <laughs> right. <laughs> I think you went okay. <laughs> Thanks, Love everyone. Stan. See you later. I've got something to show you. The Stan <gasps> moment. Come here, buddy. I feel like I should have a Dophy moment. He's had his first haircut. <gasps> nice. I'm going to show you my, my um, startup pup. Because she's had a haircut too. Stand me, Dophy. <gasps> Look at the haircuts. <laughs> Yay. I think we just have like, like a dog. I think we think we need to capture our, our, our thumbnail before we leave, don't we? <laughs> you are absolutely right. How do we do that? No, just have a smile to the camera. <laughs> the dogs. <laughs> smile, Stan. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. <laughs> right. Good boy. Well done. Anyway, right. I'll let you go. go. Bye. Have a great day. <laughs> you too, love. Bye.